Okay, so today morning, I was humming a poem of uh, Sir Edward Dyer. Uh, it was maybe around eight o'clock or nine o'clock. And that poem was, my mind to be a kingdom is. It is one of my favorite poem. And I was just uh, unknowingly, you know, un subconsciously, I was just how we gone. Poem goes like this. My mind to me a kingdom is. Such present joys therein I find. That it excels all other bliss that earth affords or grows by kind. So much I want that most would have, yet still my mind forbids to crave. No princely pomp, no wealthy star, no force to win the victory, no willy wit to solve a sore, no shape to feed a loving eye. To none of these I yield as thrall, for why, for why, my mind doth serve for all, for why my mind doth serve for all. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I, your host, Dr. Aniruddha Babar, welcomes you to yet another session of Dot Talks webinar series. Like what we always do, today's topic is also very different and rather intriguing. Today we are going to enter into the complex world of mind. We are going to explore this relatively unknown world through the eyes of Sigmund Freud. If you could remember the talk that we had in the last week, the topic was, what is man? And today we are going to talk about the mind. And that too, through the eyes of Sigmund Freud. The new millennium happens to mark the centenary of the birth of psychoanalysis. The sole parent, Sigmund Freud, has been dead for over 60 years. Indeed, he was born before the American Civil War, relatively early in the reign of Queen Victoria. Yet his contribution to modern civilization has been so profound that his work has stayed in the center of attention, whether to be praised or denigrated. That's up to, up to all of you throughout the 20th century. The current anniversary may constitute a suitable opportunity to reappraise Freud's complex over from a scientific perspective. It should, however, be noted at the outset that Freud's impact on the Western civilization was not primarily scientific. It consisted of the moral influence of his writings on the upbringing of children, on sexual attitudes, on views concerning personality problems, and so on. One way to summarize his life's work is simply to state that he invented a new scientific discipline that has steadily grown for over 100 years and every part of the developed world, an intellectual and organizational feat of some magnitude. <coughs> For its scientific writings, of course, if you could refer to his uh, uh, English translation, comprise 24 volumes and continue to be read, not only by professional psychoanalysts. In fact, so great has Freud's prestige has been in educated circles that even today, two to four generations after its original publication, his awe is commonly equated with the conceptual world of psychoanalysis. Through the development of a novel observational method, Sigmund Freud made possible the collection of reliable data about man's inner life. The scientific hypothesis he formulated about this form the initial version of psychoanalysis. Many of these first thoughts have had to be revised in the light of subsequent scientific findings about the operations of the central nervous system. But even these refuted propositions often had much heuristic value. Despite the passage of a whole century, many Freudian hypotheses have retained their scientific standing. Most important among these was Freud's realization that human thought is unusually unconscious. 
his understanding of the role of the automatic repetition of basic patterns of behavior, of the fateful consequences of early childhood emotional vicissitudes in structuring enduring mental dispositions, and of the distinction between two distinct modes of thinking. Uh, are the most significant among his many contributions. Dear friends, to further this discussion and to put more light on the subject, we have a very special guest in psychology and counseling at St. Joseph University, Dimapur, Dr. Vatinaro Longkumer. Ma'am, I request to take a charge of the discussion. Thank you so much. We are waiting for interesting perspectives. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Am I audible now? Very much, very much. Okay, thank you. So thank you very much uh, with a lot of passion, sir, uh, Dr. Aniruda. The, the moment we started talking about this, uh, coming for this uh, talk, I could sense a lot of um, passion towards the subject. And that itself has uh, brought me to understand that, you know, this is not just a subject uh, confined to only those who study, but also to, you know, people from all walks of life, whether you are a psychology student or not. Um, having said that, thank you for the um, very interesting You have already done a very good job. Um, you know, you have done a half job for me, in fact, and uh, thank you very much. Having said that, I would like to thank the organizing team and also the uh, college, one of the most vibrant colleges that I've heard um, since I was away. I, I have been studying and working at uh, Bangalore for about 10 years. And so, you know, returning back to Nagaland, um, this is just my two years of staying here in Dimapur. Uh, working in an environment such like this and uh, very interesting. I get to see a lot of activities of um, Tetsu College and I've always known that this is a very popular and happening college and I'm very, very honored and very happy to be sharing this platform with young, vibrant, dynamic professors and also young students here. This is my pleasure and I thank God for the opportunity. Um, I'm sure that when it comes to psychology, many people have a question, you know, we are always confronted with questions when we say that, you know, I have done psychology, I'm practicing, um, or I teach. The first thing that comes to everyone's mind is, can you read my mind? And that's the first question we always being confronted with. Um, on the other hand, when we talk about psychology, um, it is much more than just you know, hypnotizing or just watching someone and predicting that I know this is what you think. This is not no mystic. This is no mystic endeavor. However, this is very scientific in nature. And this has a lot of lot of work that has gone in to come to a place where we understand that, you know, a human mind can be explored scientifically. When we talk about scientific, it also talks about measurable element. So it's, it's very interesting and it's very intriguing at the same time that a human mind, the expanse of the mind can be measured by scientific approach. And it has largely to do with the contribution given by Sigmund Freud, the person we're going to talk about. I have nothing big to discuss about this because I am nobody to talk about his work, but since I'm also a very ardent, fascinated uh, student of psychology, I wish to bring this small concept, you know, something that can be easily discussed among the young students and also people who are not from psychology background. So to make it much, much simple, I just brought very three simple theories, which is quite complex, but I want to make it quite simple so that, you know, when this talk is over, you have at least three concepts understood when you leave. And at the same time, you should be able to apply. Let me remind you, the moment you hear about this topic, 
you will no longer think the same way you think about yourself or with people you talk to. Having said that, um, my first slide talks about, um, let me just give you a little gist of who this person we are talking about. I won't go much in detail who this person is. Um, this itself is a huge um, research work you have to do to learn about this amazing man we are discussing. Um, Sigmund Freud was born in the year 1956 and from Vienna, Austria, but he died in London. Um, he, he was there around the time when Nazis were, you know, hugely um, overtaking the entire Europe and it was becoming even more difficult because he was born in a Jewish family. And so you can imagine the amount of amount of fear and you know underground work they had to do when he developed this theory and a lot has gone around him that made him to introspect and 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 explore much more about the unconscious and the internal world. Um, he fled to London soon when Nazis began to occupy where he lived and he's one of the most famous scholars ever but he is not just known for a single discovery only instead he is known for the development of an encompassing theory of mind developed over span of many decades uh, for the record about five decades and he was up for a Nobel prize in medicine and literature but he didn't get it in any of one of them now the reason why he was up for this uh, medical because he was um, a bio neuro, sorry, bio neurologist by training and by profession, and he was a practicing doctor. Um, in in the midst of all this practicing, you would even imagine a person a person would even talk about you know human mind in this in this um, expanse is also a person. You can see that his exploration is quite uncanny. And at the same time, something, if, if you and I have to quote it, we might say that he was quite weird, out of the norms. Um, as a medical student, he dissected about hundreds of eels in an unsuccessful attempt to locate their reproductive system. Um, he promoted cocaine as a medical drug, but it turned out to be a dangerous and addictive idea. A few years later, he founded the groundbreaking theory called the psychoanalysis, which is a landmark study, 1900 book with the interpretation of dreams. Um, despite his success, he was often very unhappy. And in course of his very recursive research that he was undertaking, he had often quoted himself saying that the chief patient I'm always preoccupied with is myself. So you can imagine, um, in, in the course of the work that he does, he was also parallelly exploring the mind of his own. And that is when the eureka moment of discovering the unconscious part of himself has come to play, and hence the birth of psychodynamic theory. Um, perhaps because of his frustrations, he achieved a lot of insights into the source of the human unhappiness. He also proposed that we are all driven by pleasure principle, which inclines towards easy physical and emotional um, rewards and away from the treasury and uh, discipline. Now, um, he was almost universally acclaimed figure as a profoundly intellectual figure. And he was also object of considerable dislike as well. He was not only uh, not a nice man in many ways. You can always imagine when he talks about the theories. And he was very stubborn as a person. And he was also a person um, who, who brings a lot of weird uh, discoveries among his colleagues. And he defended that till he get an answer. He was deeply ambitious for the cause of promoting psychoanalysis, for the cause of presenting his views and defending it. And he was also disliked very often and hated for his views. As Nazis were growing, he was identified as a Jew who was destroying the image of the Christianity. And he was criticized by many of his theory. To, to some extent, there was some truth to it because uh, many of his theories were quite controversial in nature. And um, it was quite difficult for people 
after him, that is um, neo-Freudians, to accept certain theories that he had proposed. However, neo-Freudians uh, neo such as Carl Rogers, Alfred Adler, and the likes had also based their foundation on neuropsychodynamic uh, theory. Um, coming down to understanding, um, I was just looking for one thing. So lots of Freud, Freud's work has been replaced with modern research-based approaches, and his work is important for its historical contributions and revolutionary nature of what he proposed. So this revolutionary suggestion that each mental activity takes place outside of our conscious thoughts and awareness, that unconscious motivation and not just the conscious ones influence our thoughts, feelings, and personality. Now, bear in mind that this person was not talking about something which is visible, tangible, and measurable from our human perspective. But this man was talking about something which is not seen, something which is not talked about, and something which is not discovered. Um, having said that, he spoke clearly about three interesting um, theories and models, and I'll be discussing the first one, that is the uh, topographical model, which he talks about e ego and superego. But um, largely, let's talk about the unconscious part. Now, if you can see the, uh, the figure over there, the unconscious mind, which, is, which has a metaphorical representation of a huge iceberg, now, this iceberg uh, metaphor is a very good representation of our mind in itself. Now, the, the tip of an iceberg, which he clearly identifies as the conscious, the conscious side of us, which means if you're sitting here with me today and you're listening to me, that is received by your conscious awareness. That is your senses, the present senses of what I'm speaking to you is enabling you to uh, capture that information. And if I ask you, what did I speak in the past few seconds, maybe you should be able to tell me because you are consciously aware at that point in time. But the second layer which he talks about is the subconscious layer. Subconscious layer is retrievable. It can be received. It can be tracked backward. And yet, only with the help of therapy or only with the help of, you know, recalling, taking time to recall. And in science, we call it as um, short-term memory. Whereas the unconscious, which... Um, Freud is very popularly known to talk about is the, the massive, the massive rock that makes us of who we are. So for instance, when you listen to me, um, you know, every time I talk, you can hear that my voice intonation tends to rise up and also move down. You can see that my hand movement, you can also see my body language and my facial expression, um, which I am not aware about. And this unaware, you know, body movement or my facial expression or my tone has largely to do with my unconscious. And I have no idea what made my personality when I express something, I do this way. Now, um, he said that this unconscious part of the mind that wants in, uh, immediate gratification for primitive urges, for example, the hunger and the thirst, um, most of this, um, let me just, if you go to the next slide, can uh, the person who is using this, can you move to the next slide? Yes, psychic model, the, uh, try it. The next one, please. Correct. Um, this talks about the uh, it, ego, and superego. And um, we, are, we are hosting three parts of this in our, sub in our unconscious mind, yeah? The eat is the one which covers the large, massive rock, the much, uh, large, massive eyes. That is, our that is our unconscious. The ego is the one which is on the top, which is on the, uh, eyes of the uh, tip of the iceberg. And the superego is the one which I was talking about, the subconscious. Now, moving to the next slide, please. There are always a conflict 
with one another, especially there is a conflict between the id and the superego. And ego is the one which is in the middle, that is your conscious awareness. And there is the fight or the conversation that keeps going between the id and the superego. Remember, id is your unconscious, which is not retrievable, and the superego is the one which is in your subconscious, which can be easily retrievable. Now, there are many, um, it is true that these internal conflicts create a lot of anxiety. It, it produces anxiety and our, our desire to reduce it, that shape who we are. And according to Freud, the first unconscious emerges in the id. Now, this part of the mind needs immediate gratification, which is very primitive in nature. For example, your primitive urges like your hunger, your thirst, and also your, your urge for survival, including, um, including aggression, including, uh, you know, death and life. There's so many other concepts within it, which is not part of my uh, talk today. However, that all comes under primitive urges. Now, the id is driven by the pleasure principle or the instinctive drive to seek pleasure and avoid pain. So this id wants things right now. If I'm hungry, I want it now itself. So over time and with parents' influence, the infant develops the second influence of the unconscious, that is the superego. Now Freud described the superego as part of the mind that access the conscious and the moral compass. Like the ability to feel pride in our accomplishments, but also guilt about our shortcomings. Now, let me tell you what is the superego about. Superego are, are those parental voices, are those social voices, or those voices that came from, um, from the you know, teachers or from the moral principles, from the rights and wrongs that we were taught about, the ethics, the morality. All this comes under the superego. That is, you know, all good kind of information. Now, just imagine there is the id side of you who is hungry, who wants things now, um, and, and the superego who says, no, that is wrong. Watch out, watch your mouth, watch your hand. And there is a controlling side of you. Now, there is an urge that comes in you, and the ego is that is the conscious side of you, that is the, the now, the aware side of you, which makes which communicates between these two the ego the id and the superego and this communication is mediated intermediated by the ego and enables you to to respond either you behave either you talk it is kind of more polished polished way of representing your personality now the id and the superego battle it out in the unconscious realm like devil and angel on someone's shoulder until eventually a new unconscious emerges to bring peace, the ego or the self. Uh, most of the time we understand we always use the word ego as someone who is egoistic with pride. But the ego which we are talking about here is the actual self that is you. Um, the rational part of a person as seen by others. Now, the ego is driven by the reality principle, attempting to satisfy the needs of the id by balancing internal urges with behavior that finds the middle path of its primal desires and superegos, uh, judgment and guilt. These three aspects of a personality are also interacting within a person to influence his or her personality. Now, let's take, for example, it might say, might just yell and say, I'm hungry, I need to eat right now. But superego might yell back and say, you can't, we're in the middle of a class right now. Now the ego will middle in between and will offer a compromise. And they say, drink some water, just stick around, uh, just uh, hang on. Uh, drink some water or chew a stick of a gum and just will go after the class is done. So according to Freud, the power struggle can also lead to unhealthy behaviors, which he terms as neurosis. It is a tendency to, to experience negative emotions. Now, according to Freud, all of us, all of us um, have a certain amount of neurosis and all our behaviors, the way we behave, the way we talk has a lot to do with our neurotic um, 
tendency to perform, like for example, your nervousness, or for example, your feeling to, to rectify things um, at the moment, all this neurosis that is the anxiety, which is not seen, tends to drive to enable you to perform and also to behave. It is a tendency to experience negative emotions. For example, an overpowered aid might lead to impulsivity, while underpowered aid might lead someone to deny, deny to their needs. So if your aid is very much overpowered, you might turn out to be a very impulsive person who wants to react immediately. Whereas a person who has a very weak id, or the id is, has a less power, then very likely that you might deny what you want and you may not be able to voice it. Um, so small imbalances can lead to infamous um, Freudian slip. Now, Freudian slip is a very popular word and uh, we use a lot of these concepts a lot uh, today, uh, slip of tongue. So, for example, um, you want to use the word, I love you, but you end up saying, I hate you. Now, that's a slip of tongue. Now, according to Freud, this is not a slip that just happened out of nowhere. It did happen because there is some anxiety that is within you and that you have no control over. When you are confronted with, uh, when you're confronted with uh, uh, provoking anxiety provoking situation, that is when you start to show this anxiety through slip of tongue. Now, for example, you say, I'm, I'm glad you are here. Instead of saying, I'm glad you are here, you might say, I'm sad you are here because you don't like that person visiting you. So that, according to him, is how you, um, during this mistaken words that you use, which you didn't mean, but you often use it. When larger melons occur, people try to handle the building anxiety with defense mechanisms, um, like unconscious which sometimes unhealthy behaviors intended to reduce anxiety and protect ourselves from the discomfort. Now, um, it's very interesting how he built the theory. Like, for example, your unconscious anxiety that you are not comfortable with and your ego, on the other hand, is trying to protect you from, from being ashamed, from being uh, confronted, from being, uh, you know, confronted by those realities. And so the reality, in order to tackle with your reality, your ego enables you to bypass something, bypass the situation by building uh, a defense mechanism, which is also sometimes unconscious. It is unconscious because you have practiced over a period of time. Either you have modeled it, that is, you saw your parents doing it. Either you saw some of your teachers or some of your elders who have modeled this uh, defense mechanism or you have practiced over a period of time um, because this mechanism this defense mechanism um, you can please move the slide this defense mechanism will enable you to enable you to confront your emotional provoking situation by um, you know, handling the situation without much embarrassment or without much guilt. Some of these mechanisms are kind of healthy, like sublimation. Sublimation is one of the defense mechanisms, and it is considered as one of the healthiest ones um, because it is helping you to redirect, um, you know, socially, our socially unex uh, un unacceptable desires into a much more socially appropriate behaviors. For example, you have aggression, you have an aggressive desire. Um, so in order to handle that, your defense mechanism may help you to enroll you to, into a martial art class. So in martial art or in boxing or in wrestling, um, your aggression is socially acceptable and it is okay to show aggression in those platforms. So those um, unconscious aggression and anger which you have can sometimes be sidelined, can be sublined into a much more socially acceptable behavior. Others such as denial or refusing to accepting unpleasant events as real can lead to distortion 
of problematic reality. There is also one more ego defense mechanism that many of us, many of us use, that is denial. Denial is also one of the defense mechanism. Like for example, um, let me just quote you an example, a mother losing a daughter or losing a child. Now a mother, just to come to terms that she has lost a child, it is so painful for her to, to come to terms that the child is no more in her hand. And what she might do is she will leave all the baby stuff untouched as if the child is still alive. She may iron the clothes, she may keep all the dolls, she may keep the room intact as it is, as if the child is coming back. That is known as a denial. Because when you're denying that the reality has happened, it, it sort of pacifies that, that anxiety that you are facing. And that is also some part of the uh, defense mechanism that many of us use a lot of times. Um, other defense mechanism like displacement, move to the next slide, there is the displacement there. Yeah, so um, displacement is a tactic, is a tactic that we use to transfer our desires or our un, uh, undesirable impulses onto a substitute person or an object, most likely someone who is much weaker than us. So for example, a student scolded by a teacher in the class may just shout at the juniors or just slam the door or maybe just go home and just you know uh, scream at your at your brother for just using your video game or something like that so displacement is also most of the time in workplace if you uh, if you can see the picture over there um, a person has been Fired from fired from the job in, at the office and uh, um, coming to can you move on to the next one reaction formation is reaction formation is a person displaying a fear that is exactly opposite of an impulse. Now this is also so need ourselves using this. Um, it is like, for example, you are uncomfortable with a certain emotion, and and so you you tend to you tend to show this on the other person. For example, um, you know, in, in this picture, you can say that acting like you hate someone, you really have a crush on. So you actually like. Have you not seen, especially in teenage group of people, um, you actually secretly have a crush on the person, but because you are worried that the person may reject you. You are also anxious that people may come to know that you like the person, and so you tend to, you know, tarnish the person's name or just name call or label the person, and you tend to just make meme out of it. And you know, in this generation, so sometimes we do that. Uh, the next one, regression. This can, uh, sorry, repression. Um, please bear in mind that repression and suppression are. Two different words. We often use the word suppression uh, many a times. Please bear in mind that these two, repression and suppression, does the same action, but one is consciously and the other one is unconsciously. Now, repression is what we what Freud meant by the large mass of iceberg, which is below, much much below the sea level. And the suppression is perhaps the one which is in the surface, almost on the surface level. Now, suppression is, for example, you're very, very angry. So in order, because your ego, your ego is talking with you that, listen, you're angry, but this is not an appropriate place for you to show your anger. So hold on. And that's when you start to count one to ten. You are kind of pushing pushing that uncomfortable anxiety into your subconscious level. It doesn't mean that you forgot at all. Whereas repression is a kind of an uncomfortable emotion, but it is so, so uncomfortable and anxiety provoking emotion, so much so that it goes into the carpet. It is swapped into the carpet in your unconscious and you deny that it exists. 
This happens to many a times people who underwent traumatic experience like rape, like abuse, and also accidents, that something like this has happened. And only in course of time, remember Freud said that all this unconscious that you have no control over, oftentimes it resurfaces in your behavior and it dictates your personality a lot of times. And largely, this has to do with your repressed emotions. The next one, please. Regression is, um, it is a function, a form of a retreat. You're going back to your childhood stage, enabling a person to psychologically go back in time to a period when the person felt much safer. Uh, this is an example of, you know, when we go back to our childhood stage. So, for example, a, a small kid, a small kid going down to, for example, uh, a baby, a doll is broken, and naturally, what does it, how, how could the child show his anxiety or, or, or frustration? She will cry without any reservation. She will just express. Uh, but when, when you and I become an adult, uh, just because your, your tire broke on the road, you cannot just stand there and cry. Because your adult ego controls you that this is not a, this is not a appropriate place. But regression is those people who uses this without much restriction. We tend to retreat back. For example, um, you had a breakup or you failed in the exam and you are just crying publicly. You are just, you are just throwing tantrum publicly. And this is kind of a method, a coping mechanism that you learn. And the frightening situation that you have you have faced, you cannot control it, and you tend to use regression. That is crying, sulking, or eating a lot, or sleeping a lot. That is how a child usually uses their most uncomfortable emotions. The next one, please. Um, projection is, as we all know, how a projector is used. Um, I have my materials here in my laptop. And when I use a projector, it is shown on the other wall. It's something like that. So this is a characteristics of, or a desire that, which is unacceptable, which is in me. For example, I don't like a behavior about myself. And now I'm trying to point out at someone that, you know what, you are a very proud person. You know what, you are a very, uh, you know, uh, you are a person who does not respect people. So if these are the emotions that I don't like about myself, I tend to show this on the other person and then call them or label them. The last one is rationalization. Um, it is, the classic example that I can think of is uh, the fox uh, that, you know, fox and the sour grapes. So you have attended, you have attended something and uh, you could not achieve it. You have done something, you could not do it. And so what you do is you start to rationalize, explain your failure, explain your attempt, and explain something that was not acceptable for you into something much more logical, something much more uh, you know, acceptable for yourself and for others. Um, so... All these defense mechanisms, in a way, um, sometimes we are not, we, we may not agree that this is fine for us. And this mechanism, sometimes we depend on many factors, such as the behaviors which we have seen or modeled, as I told you. And for us, the past that we have experienced, we often use this because of the unresolved conflict. Now, um, Coming down to the next slide, this is the most important, uh, you know, stages of development of a personality. And uh, this was the other theories that he spoke about was kind of acceptable and kind of welcomed by his, uh, you know, fraternity. But the moment he showed this psychosexual development of uh, infant developing into uh, adult personality, that was when uh, there was a huge backlash. And uh, five stages of personality development he talked about is um, 
the first one is the oral stage and this oral stage Freud believes that individual may shift through each of these stages the five stages he believed that we go through each of these stages and in this particular order and in order to develop a healthy and adult personality the shift in zones now he says that each of these stages we go through um, there are some erogenous zone erogenous zone means there is a zone which which satisfies our pleasure which give which gives us pleasure which satisfies our ego basically and during the development we are driven by libido or the energy libido is um, what we in, in our current context we discuss it as a sexual energy but in his sexual energy it is it is not necessarily to about sexual intercourse information but this is about your uh, your your psychic energy that is your libido which enables you to generate uh, for for a uh, survival instinct so the energy drives the urges by the id of each stages which leads to push back from the super ego and also result in conflict and resulting it moves us through the development of stages but importantly if a person does not resolve the conflict um, at a given stage they will become fixated or stuck at that stage which had a huge impact on our personality um, you can see on the on the on the first one i have written the stages and the second is the age on which these uh, particular particular um, erogenous zones are fixed at and also the focus of the libido or the erogenous zone these are the these are the parts of a body where freud believes that these energies are are stayed uh, the next one is the major developmental uh, changes that we make in those particular age group and also the last one according to him is if you finish the third stage uh, the third column very clearly for example um, if if this is the stage when a baby is, is supposed to be crawling now in in this crawling stage if the child passes this stage successfully he or she will develop into a much healthier personality but if the person does not uh, past the stage successfully then he or she might end up with a conflict and that can also drive and huge have a huge impact on the personality now coming down to the first one that is the oral stage which is from zero to one years of age um, it lasts from birth to about one year of age and in this stage pleasure is felt on the mouth and so the infant receives satisfaction through things like feeding using pacifiers and sucking one's thumb the conflict of this age arises when the infant is weaning and moves from milk formula to solid food so they need to let go of the oral pleasures of and renew them in order to adapt them to the reality of the adult world now this process is stressful to the infant but they adapt with time however if this process does not go smoothly the result will be oral fixation which could be seen in adult behavior such as someone who is a chain smoker someone who is uh, you know who does drinking overeating or you know having behaviors like nail biting biting um, anything you do with your mouth so um, freud identifies that someone especially during your anxiety provoking situation when you are involved in this behaviors he believes that hypothetically he believes that perhaps you your uh, oral stage hasn't been smoothly passed on and you are fixated in oral stage the second one is anal stage which lasts from one year to three years of age and in this stage the conflict focuses on a desire to pee and defecate well and the reality of the potty training this is the stage when a child you know past feces and um, you know uh, the child has no control over his his bladder and his uh, bowel system uh, bowel system so uh, freud believed that this is the time when the parents parents train the child 
train the child and speak to them that if you want to pee, let us know. If you want to go to uh, poop, let us know. So there is a lot of struggle when a child, sometimes with his bowel system or, or with, with his bladder system, it, it wants to just pee. It just wants to just poop. But because now remember, this is when the super ego comes into play. So the ego is when the parents come and say that, no, you have defecated, you have peed without warning. So this is the struggle that a child goes through during this puppy training. And uh, Freud believed that parents would push through hard. When the child, when a parent is too strict on the child at this particular age, especially too early, it could later cause an individual become very obsessed with neatness and organization. And today, what we call as OCD, yeah, obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, this has a connection of how a person with, you know, neatness, perfection, and also, you know, very particular about organizing, you know, uh, is considered as a person who is fixated on anal stage, perhaps. Or it can also be a person if, uh, you know, if a parent is not very well involved, or sometimes when a when a parent is extremely strict and the child was not able to learn well, uh, he may turn out to be uh, lead to adult messiness and also carelessness sometimes. The third one is the phallic stage, which is one of the most controversial theory. And this is the theory where, um, you know, he, he received a lot of backlash because of uh, the concepts that he had used here to identify our our personality. Now, it lasts from three to six years of age when Freud believed that children become aware of the physical differences between boys and girls. And as a result, um, and as a result, uh, they begin to feel the desire for the opposite sex. Remember, uh, this erogenous zone is the genitalia. And uh, the child starts to become aware of the body, aware of the genitals. And he starts to observe even the genitals of the parents, that is, the one who stays with him all the time. Um, there is a concept of Oedipus complex and Electro complex. Um, Oedipus complex is for boys, where boys, uh, they also call it as, um, this is the time when penis envy, there is a concept called as penis envy, where the, the girl child, uh, notices that she does not have a penis, but she notices that her dad has a penis, and she wants to have it. But um, and and that's when she starts to project this on the mother, and she starts to take the mother because the mother gets to sleep with the father who has who has what she wants. On the other hand, the boy develops erebus complex, which is the boy develops a a feeling and. Um, erroneous feeling towards the mother and uh, towards the mother and he has he has a jealousy towards the father because he he sees his father uh, sleeping next to the to the mother and so this concept is quite controversial and people were not ready to accept that th this is so obnoxious and this is so absurd to even uh, you know think of a child having a feeling, sexual feeling, towards one's parents. And um, according to him, this is the time when we become conscious of our, our genitalia. And that is when, you know, uh, a, a boy or a girl identifies that I'm a female or I'm a male. And hence, the parents, we tend to, we tend to model the parent we identify with. For example, I'm a girl and as I realize that I do not have what I want, I may start to identify with the same sex parents that is my mom, and I start to model my mom. Now, this conflict is resolved when the child realizes that aligning with the same parent in direction and brings closer to the opposite sex better. And um, a failure to shift this alignment would lead to jealousy, overambition, and also attention seeking in adult behavior. So from there, Freud believed that children reach a relatively stable period called as latency stage. Now, um, latency stage is also called as the silent period, latent period. 
um, it doesn't have an uh, erogenous zone where the urges are very quiet at this time. Now, if you look at the age there, 6 to 12, that is the time when the child is, is going to school and his schoolwork, he has, he's starting to develop friendship with his friends, outside people. So he has no, no much contact whatsoever with his, with his uh, caregiver anymore. And so uh, this is the time when, when his socializing happens, he starts to forget that this anxiety, this in, he starts to forget this anxiety part, and that's when he develops his social relation. Um, is able to develop in ways focusing on the schools and hobbies and friends. And however, things are thrown into disorder again when the child hits puberty and enters the genital stage. Now, genital stage is where there is a sexual awakening. Uh, that is the pre-awakening, but instead of being focused on a parent, it's now redirected to a socially acceptable partners. Now, uh, this is, if you look at the age here, what uh, Freud has given, 22 plus, that is when uh, young adults start to date, start to think about, think about uh, settling down and, um, you know, accepting the opposite sex as someone you can, you can, uh, continue relationship with and this is the time when your your sexual urges starts to reawaken and uh, you no longer focus on your parents it is redirected to um, th there is one very interesting uh, point that he made here that oftentimes according to Paul once again oftentimes our redirection to getting attracted to an opposite sex is often again unconsciously driven by our attraction to our opposite, opposite sex parent. And therefore, when you look for a woman, when you look for a man, you tend to look for someone or you tend to get attracted to someone who has a very similar characteristics of the parent that you have envied in the past, you know, very unconsciously. And a failure to manage these desires into adulthood could lead to impotence and unsatisfying relationship now at this point you might have a lot of questions like why did freud draw a lot of focus on sex or what about children who have single parent or what about gay people who are not even attracted to opposite sex now these are all good questions and it helps us to understand why freud's theory everything that is the eight ego and super ego to the five stages of development uh, of our personality and also the defense mechanism of how uh, the adult personality has has come into um, into not only relying uh, you know all these developments don't only really align with our modern understanding of the brain and the behavior having said that Freud's theory of the mind has profoundly influenced in the field of psychology and the idea of the unconscious mind or that our adult self could be influenced by the past trauma and the past experiences, the painful memories, the idea that our childhood experiences could shape our personality and behavior at all. This is all part of the extensive legacy Freud has created. And we all cannot deny that this theory is extremely fascinating and it only opens opens our brain to explore different parts of how we understand a person is it only paves way to help us explore and understand us as a person and not simply deny and pass it off as uh, next to nothing um, there are two interesting quotes that I like about it, uh, about Freud's, one of my favorites, unexpressed emotions will never die. They are just buried alive and will come forth later in uglier ways. And the next one, from error to error, one discovers the entire truth. Thank you very much. I hope uh, this journey of exploring Freud's uh, theory has enabled us to rediscover and make us more alive than ever. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vati Naro. The purpose has been served. <laughs> I, I remember how, how I was behind you uh, to, to pursue you to talk on this very, very important uh, topic. Very intriguing, uh, very important. And uh, well, it has often seen that, that uh, Freud uh, has been uh, misunderstood, you know, by most of the people. Now, of course, there are so many questions, uh, but I have not uh, seen a single question in the chat box. But I have my own question. Uh, if you could uh, try to answer it, I would be really glad. Uh, first of all, thank you uh, for your enlightening talk. And uh, my question, my question uh, would be based on my own readings. Uh, I have been a student of psychology. Of course, I have not studied psychology but I have been student of psychology since so many years and uh, my question is that that see uh, one of the uh, lo uh, you know the largest criticism uh, of this uh, psychoanalytic theory uh, is that it uh, places far more or so much of emphasis on childhood right I mean uh, basically childhood uh, the, the entire hypothesis of uh, mr. Freud is revolves around childhood if you if you remove that childhood the entire theory collapses right so see uh, since it is evolved, uh, revolving around the childhood now here the criticism is the freud's theory is that you know uh, the childhood experiences okay they influences uh, adult behavior but at the same time uh, the modern uh, psychologist and psychiatrist uh, fraternity uh, uh, believe that and this and this belief have leveled a sort of uh, uh, you know a criticism against uh, you know freud's theory that development is not only confined to the childhood right experience only confined to the childhood but rather it's a lifelong process so how are you going to you know uh, deal with this uh, criticism which is normally being leveled by you know the psychologist fraternity uh, against uh, Mr. Freud. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> That's a very interesting question. Um, I think you have already answered the question when you asked to me already because uh, the, your question itself stems from the fact that you also believe that development largely, our development of a personality has largely to do with our childhood experience. Um, I, yes, with all the theories, with all the difficulties and uh, the controversies that his theories have, um, you know, uh, sparked on the on, on psychology as a whole. But we cannot deny because neo-Freudians such as um, uh, Carl, not Carl Rogers, who is that? Um, Erickson. Eric Erickson had also continued to talk about the stages of development. And also there are other theories which has talked about child development first. And they have predicted, they have predicted this child development into your adult personality. Now let's take, for example, we cannot predict the fruit. We cannot predict a tree branches or the health of a tree without having to understand the root or without having to understand uh, you know the health of the 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 base of the tree now childhood development our personality development has a huge rest on our childhood development now one thing i like about freud's theory is that he speaks very strongly about our unconscious mind and whether we accept or whether we believe it or not um, if you really explore from this area a large part of a personality does have an influence starting from how you speak to starting from how you even think there is a lot of dictating uh, element which has been which has been created in our mind that is a template of our experience what we call it as core belief what we call it as uh, uh, a st oh, what is that a core belief or or a template that we have because this template does not does not just come out of nowhere it comes from our experience 
And so all this development that they talk about cannot bypass childhood development. And yes, there are other theories which came up to that, like behavioral theory, like cognitive theory. And so all these theories that came after this, and there is the psychosocial theory, which came after saying that not all developments rests on your past experience, but it has a large, large portion of it has to do with your social relationship and the people you meet after or your cognitive your cognitive uh, reframing of your experiences. Now, um, when I'm also a very ardent believer in cognitive behavioral therapy, behavioral sciences, and at the same time, we cannot deny the fact that, especially when it comes to therapy, especially when it comes to uh, psychodynamic analysis, we cannot, but we cannot help but move back to how their childhood was, how their family of origin was or understanding the origin of the personality, who he or she appears to me today. OK, thank you so much. So uh, what you are trying to say is that that Sigmund Freud uh, tried to rationalize uh, my behavior uh, as an adult. So my question would be, if Freud's theory rationalizes my behavior as an adult, then what would rationalize child's behavior? OK, um, you think child's behavior will be rationalized? Because that is when well, that's very interesting. It, yeah, yeah. That, right. That is when the behavior sciences, that is when the behavior comes in and the environmental science comes in. But what Freud talks about is that if you look at the uh, stages, he talks about from zero, from zero to the first stage. Uh, where is that slide? Yeah, if you look at the table over there, he talks about a child's erogenous, uh, the child's stage of zero to one year old. That is when you were born, and that's when you start developing as a human person. And that itself, he talks about how a person develops. It's not about, there is the unconscious part of it. I clearly understand when you say, uh, how would Freud explain a child from zero to one? Yeah, going back to the genesis of the person. So the theory starts from here, where he talks about uh, once a child is born, once a child is born, he comes with a clear slate. And the moment he starts, and the moment he starts interacting, the moment he starts, because the child comes with a clear state with only his instincts. There is only his instincts. Other than that, there is nothing. So from zero to one, that's when his instincts are working. And from one to three, that is when the ego starts to develop. And I think most of the time, uh, Development of a personality is spoken based on the ego, based on the ego. OK, OK. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, there, there may be many more questions from my side. Right. I will, I will yeah. say to myself. Uh, but yeah, there I'm are sorry. two questions which are coming. There are two questions which are coming uh, from the audience. Uh, first question has been asked by uh, Mr. Mosa S. Sanktam. So Mr. Sanktam asks you, can you divulge into personality traits of a child with that of his parents, hereditary trait that we see similar with his or her child? You are say on this. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Why not? Personality trait, personality trait of a child, surely, because that is the uh, that is the theory of hereditary, hereditary theory and. Uh, Yes, that is a theory of hereditary uh, personality. Sorry, I don't know what's wrong with me. Again, Freud and Flip, come here. There is an anxiety coming up. <laughs> yeah. So um, I don't know if you're asking in terms of Freud, but if you're asking in terms of personality development, yes, there is a theory which speaks clearly. That is the personality trait theory, which says that you and I do have traits that we have 
inherited from her parents that is very biological and at the same time there is a lot to do with our environmental factor which is called as modeling modeling the parents behavior and their personality that makes our personality trait solid as much as our parents we look at okay thank you uh, next question has been asked by uh, dr ranjan kumar behra and uh, his question is what according to you the need of freud psychology in today's context what according to you the need of freud psychology in today's context dr behra yeah. yeah thank you sir you are here good to know that you are here and you are listening um according to me because i'm a psychotherapist i'm a practicing psychotherapist like Psych, um freud's theory is the basic foundation to how i understand a person it it starts from observing a person's behavior starting from the body language to the tone of the voice to the cognitive made up which has large i believe which has largely to do with the unconscious unconscious mind that the person is not aware about in psychodynamic counseling and therapy we always look at the conflicts the anxiety provoking words the anxiety provoking conflicts of the mind which is in their cognitive frame and also in the words for example a person might say that i like sitting in your class but the body language might say something else for me understanding a person identifying those behavioral aspects something which i can measure from a very observation from my observation it has largely to do with what freud psychology has enabled me in today's context okay hello yes i can hear you okay thank you thank you now there's a third yeah now there's a third question Uh, which is uh, asked by avivedi and uh, hello ask question uh, freud's yeah. theory sounds very interesting however his theory failed to explain why it comes to gender neutrality for instance when we take the case of women and lgbtqia could you comment very interesting question rather <laughs> interesting however this theory fails to explain when it comes to gender gender neutrality for instance absolutely absolutely because um the question itself questions his theory absolutely because um if you look at the psychosexual development he hasn't spoken about he hasn't spoken about this population but if you look at the adult fixation example he spoke about uh if if one does not fully develop or successfully pass this genital age uh, genital stage then the person is very likely to develop to develop a sexual dysfunction but he hasn't talked about gender identity in here because when you talk about lgbtqia plus um, you're also talking about gender identity here so in this in this uh, particular theory he talked about only your sexual identity hello yes yes please hello, go can ahead can you hear me yeah yes yeah. very okay. much okay so he only talked about only when a person does not develop or completely successfully complete this stage then the person might be sexually immature or mentally unhealthy that's what this adult fixation in this particular fixation he talked about but um if you're asking my opinion if you're asking my opinion about lgbtq um we cannot always rely um i don't know what freud would say but i would also like to go back to understanding the unconscious now exploring the unconscious part um 
correct me if I'm wrong. And this, I solely take responsibility of my opinion of saying what I understand about LGBTQ. Um, most of these sexual identity or gender identity that a person in the adult stage recognizes about himself or herself also stems a lot from their past traumatic experience. This is once again from my reading and my experience, uh, sorry, from my, from my opinion. So a lot has to do with, with um, identifying themselves through some traumatic experience. For example, they underwent abuse. Or for example, they were never accepted uh, from the opposite sex. Or they, were, they never got enough love or attention from the parent of the same sex. So remember, in the theory, he talks about when you are fixated, when you're not given enough attention, then you're most likely to develop attention seeking or most likely to develop uh, relationship issues in building even a relationship. Now, identifying yourself as the other sex, identifying yourself can also be answered by different phenomena, different entities such as the social observation, there, there are other theories which can also talk about from the behavioral perspective, from um, you know observation perspective, and from psychosocial development perspective. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you so much. Okay, there, there is one more question from uh, Mr. Supong Tonsu Longchair, and he is asking, Dr. Wati, thank you for the uh, exposition. Uh, to you, what would be Freud's exposition on cultural determination? Yes, Freud's exposition on cultural determinism. Okay. Um, from my understanding, he hasn't delved much into cultural determinism. But of course, if you look at his, um, if, if you look at his work, a lot has been questioned about an upbringing. About an upbringing. So when I talk about upbringing, I'm also talk about culture, which has a lot to do with, um, with the upbringing. Now, remember, in my first slide, I spoke about how his, how his environment, how the situation around him, his relationship with people, his family relationship itself was something that was disturbing him. And hence, he was only exploring the vast area of his unconscious. That's when he started to meet himself by exploring that area. Now, remember that his work has only talked mostly on this area, but he hasn't talked much on the cultural determinism. Maybe I may not have come across this word, but um, if you want me to link this to, I believe that when he spoke about family environment, when he speaks about a child's environment where he or she grew up, and that experiences has largely to do with my, uh, with my current behavior, I think he was also hinting at this cultural determinism in some sense. I don't know if I've answered your question. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vati Naro, for your answers. Uh, is there any other question, please? Today is an opportunity. Please ask any any damn question connected with psychology. Okay, Nisha, has Freud also covered personality disorders? Has Freud also covered personality disorders? Yes, he spoke about... Um, the first case that he worked with was uh, with a woman called Anna. That was his first case. That's when he started to discover about the unconscious mind. And um, it was a case of a hysteria. It, initially, in the beginning, uh, before all these personality disorders came into being, or the clinical disorders came into being, um, all those, most of the disorders that is being aligned to women and also aligned to hysteria. Remember, he was, um, he was a medical doctor who was a clinical practitioner. So most of his cases he dealt with uh, was in line with, with, with neurological conditions. Now, in one of these neurological conditions that he was dealing with, there was another person, his, his, um, 
his colleague Joseph uh, Joseph, with whom he was working under, he has worked using the unconscious pattern of the person, Anna, Anna O. Um, interestingly, this is very much in line with what we understand, uh, what we understand paranoid personality disorder. Um, but he hasn't coined these words, what we understand personality disorders such as OCD or paranoid personality disorder. None of these has been coined from his site, but absolutely he has also spoken about personality. Personality and, oh, oh sorry, you're talking about split personality. Okay, okay, that is the first one, all right. And you're talking about pers uh, split personality. Um, you please go back and read an uh, interesting concept on object relation. And he has talked interesting about interesting concept about splitting. There is a concept called the splitting that he speaks about, which will uh, invariably help you to identify, understand this split personality disorder that he talked about. Yeah, I've seen Emily Rose. I know you would, uh, I know what you're talking about. I don't know what uh, Freud might say, but uh, going by how he understands our unconscious uh, repressed emotion and repressed anxiety often and comes yeah, out into... Sorry? Sorry? Misha has also asked about Emiros. Correct, correct. I was, just, uh, I was just taking a look at that. Yeah. How would he express? How would he oh, express on yeah. Emily Rose? <laughs> yeah, it's, yes, I don't yes. know. You, you are getting too much into <laughs> detail. I don't know how to put this. But if, if um, Freud was there, I'm sure he would have gone back to look at. Um, for, those who, for those who are asking these questions, remember Freud has used something called as free association. Free association is one of the therapeutic technique that he used when he speaks with the client and that's when he starts to associate those random emotions and words the client spoke. And um, if Emily Rose, if, if, if Emily Rose would be uh, Freud's, Freud's uh, client today, I'm sure that he would have taken her to the couch and would have allowed her to just speak and must have used free association to connect all those missing dots of how those uh, her schizophrenic episodes have developed. OK, thank you. Is there any other question? Doctor, the, okay. the question, yes, please. Yeah, please go ahead. Can I please request the participant to kindly type your question because your audio is not very clear to me. It's breaking. Yes, it is better to type. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Sir Supong, you can you can type your question. Okay. Meanwhile, he type his question. Uh, I just want to ask you something uh, about uh, fetishism, right? Uh, when you read about uh, Sigmund Freud and while he was uh, developing a theory, he spoke a lot about uh, the fetishism aspect also. And when we speak about a sexual fetishism, of course, uh, you know, the roots can be found according to Sigmund Freud in the childhood experiences. But now as a psychotherapist, right, uh, you may come across, uh, you know, a married, married couple or people, okay, who are either blessed to have fetishism or either suffering from fetishism. 
right you can take it positively you can take it negatively also right for fetishism for one person may be a curse and for the other person it may be a blessing right so question is has uh, sigmund freud uh, has attempted to uh, uh, deal with this duality of experiences of the people especially in the married couple when the the fetish aspects are mismatch what is your take on it okay my take on it <laughs> um i i haven't explored this part of i mean i haven't thought about this part of it but um there was a very interesting concept that uh, during one of my training on uh, dream interpretation um there was something that came very strongly in this is especially when it comes to sexual development um we often think as i as i keep, as i've uh, already claimed in the beginning the sexual energy or the sexual libido we discuss in those uh, in the concept here has less to do with the sexual the biological sexual part of it but it has a it has nothing to do with your sexual energy which is your unconscious energy now coming down to your question of when you say when there is a mismatch in in the in the energy of the uh, couple i don't know how to put this across um i'm not ready to respond to this i i have my own opinion but um i don't know if this is something that i'm ready to respond right now okay 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 thank you uh supong uh, typing your question okay all right anyway uh if if there are no questions uh then allow me to thank our speakers on behalf of all of us ma'am thank you so much for your time and uh, also my gratitude to you because you have uh, uh, shown your inclination to take up this very complex topic because understanding sigmund freud is not at all easy uh, it has been said that the most misunderstood misunderstood people in this world are two that is one is uh, frederick nietzsche and the second is sigmund freud right but you have attempted to decipher sigmund freud uh, to all of us for that thank you thank you so much and if there are uh, other questions uh, i'll take those questions and i'll email you okay i i believe uh, you would like to answer them thank you so much and uh, yes uh, have a great evening of your head we'll meet again with another session with another speaker thank you so much thank you so much thank you, so much. Thank you.